Well, uh, thank you, everybody. It's a tough, tough act to follow. Um, I'm very privileged to be on this uh, platform and following like the, these these greats. So um, I, I can't claim to have the great wisdom of uh, uh, the previ previous speakers, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, this is a showcase of a project that McHugh did a couple of years ago for uh, a notable uh, client of ours, McDonald's, and uh, it, it happened through very close. Um, very early and very, uh, um, like, you know, basically uh, a deep uh, a collaboration between all the, all the uh, partners of this uh, particular project. So, um, okay, excellent. So, uh, um, basically, the, my talk is about, like, you know, improving uh, concrete productivity by a designer contractor collaboration. So, here's a photo of the um, um, almost topped out uh, structure um, uh, looking at the north elevation. Um, so just give you a big quick uh, background uh, the where this project's located at. It's in the city of Chicago on the west side. It was actually uh, um, at the old Oprah Winfrey uh, um, uh, studio site, so kind of a notable uh, location in Chicago. Um, and to start with, like, what was the client's vision? So here's some, some like, you know, renderings and mixture of photos of actually what we built, but it was basically a new uh, ground-up uh, um, uh, headquarters for, like, you know, notable uh, a global corporation. It was 720,000 uh, square foot building on a whole entire city block site uh, bounded by uh, uh, Randolph Street and two levels of underground uh, uh, parking. And then so here's like, you know, of course, the, you know, the, the main entrance. This is actually a photo of that completed work. But what the client wanted was some, uh, uh, like an architecture that reflected the kind of industrial warehouse uh, character of the area. So it's showing kind of uh, like, you know, big, large, uh, you know, storefront windows, um, express brick, express uh, uh, like st uh, steel like structure in the facade. Um, and then here's a actual uh, a photo of the completed structure here. So beautiful um, uh, headquarters there in the, like in the west side of Chicago. And then they have, uh, you know, uh, you know, the necessary corporate space. So they got some collaboration spaces. They got some pretty cool uh, staircases to allow like circulation to get people to meet. And then uh, some really cool, um, like, you know, uh, uh, top floor city views for again more collaboration. And then uh, some more spaces to meet. And then of course they have the Happy Meal Toy Museum there as well. So that was also <laughs> part of the project. But anyways, that was their vision, and it was really critical for for them to like you know basically rapidly um, go from you know an idea, a concept, and a need to actually like you know basically hit, hitting the target with a uh, with a, um, on schedule and on budget. So uh, roughly what the you know some basic statistics. Uh, um, the, the, the owner developer was Sterling Bay. Um, the, uh, they hired us. Their tenant was the McDonald's, or McDonald's Corporation. And uh, um, the duration from um, us breaking ground to handing over the, the completed structure for McDonald's to move in was uh, 18 months. So it was a very ambitious schedule. Uh, the the um, total size of the project, about 720,000 square feet with uh, nine stories above grade. And the project cost was $146 million. So we were basically um, like you know, $2 million per week was what we were thinking about, like how fast. Um, our scope of work was the uh, core and shell elevators, uh, ninth floor build out, um, uh, bathroom construction, and the underground parking, um, and uh, roof and uh, terrace landscaping. While we handed over floors, then they had uh, uh, like you know basically interior fit out company that was basically putting in uh, the tenant uh, build out space. So how do you build a burger? Um, two all beef pat patties, uh, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, kind of an old uh, um, uh, you know um, uh, homage to um, Big Mac. But uh, how do you uh, build a world-class headquarters in 18 months? Um, design team and contractor were assigned early. Uh, Kerry talked about this. Uh, um, you know, b basically, you know, getting the design team and the contractor, um, like, you know, hired and working collaboratively. And actually, in this particular project, um, uh, Sterling Bay um, hired us, um, like, pretty much the same time as the design team. So, like, you know, we were immediately starting conversations, immediately working on collaboration, and basically the, um, the design um, was uh, very much respectful of uh, the, des the construction process, and the construction process was obviously very respectful to what the, the client ultimately wanted. So, and, and like, as they say, like, you know, plan the work, work the plan. So, um, our, the keys to keeping our uh, client happy was, uh, like, you know, um, basically focusing on the deadline, focusing on the, the deadline date. That was uh, absolutely above all the, the critical goal of all parties to the team. So it was an open line of communication between, um, uh, you know, uh, McDonald's and Sterling Bay, the, uh, the, the client and the tenant, uh, Gensler, the architect, and um, um, James McHugh Construction, the GC. So um, we were um, basically focused on making sure that the milestones were informing all decision making, including the architect, and reminding the in our role in, as GC was reminding the owner and the architect when their design decisions were going to basically have an impact on the schedule, and so and then basically keeping everybody heads up about milestones and, and always working uh, with and not against, just as a, just a general philosophy. 
Um, these are the team players that actually pulled it all off. So again, on the left, you got the um, Sterling Bay and McDonald's uh, as a, uh, the, uh, the the landlord and the tenant. On um, the design team, uh, Genser MKA and the ERS uh, Earth Retention. Um, and uh, sorry, the geotech was ECS. And on the contractor team was uh, James McHugh uh, Construction and um, McHugh Concrete as the um, uh, concrete shell. And we have collaborated with uh, Michaels and Collins Engineering for the ERS. And then Roy Strom was the uh, excavation contractor. So just give you a uh, like you know, basically a uh, understanding of like what the real structure looks like. This is a uh, Tecla model, a nice rendering that really does show what like you know this is what was cast in place, and it kind of helps you uh, like you know um, uh, inform you like you know how we selected the structural system to basically hit our hit our target. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, basically nine stories above grade, and then you're seeing like two levels below grade, and you're also seeing a rendering of all the. Uh, um, uh, the drilled shaft uh, um, uh, 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 caissons that were um, basically um, straight from rock all the way up through the lower level two basement, continued through uh, um, level one, lower level one basement up to the underside of, uh, uh, of the first floor. That was uh, they, those drilled shafts were the in, uh, columns for the garage. Um, the structure was like what uh, an old school uh, two-way flat slab reinforced concrete uh, slab with drop panels. As you can see um, the advantage there. Was um, obviously uh, like you know we could uh, um, basically um, uh, rapidly um, work with a two-day cycle and also um, uh, basically allow uh, for like you know lots and lots of uh, expected uh, um, uh, tenant modification in the future. So um, even though we are a big fan of PT because of the uh, uh, tenant requirements for uh, adaptability for future reuse, uh, we we chose uh, reinforced concrete. Um, so. Uh, another like um, discussion about the structural system. Um, having a cast in place office office structure is very unusual, and uh, um, you know again collaboratively working with the, uh, um, the, the the our client, we're basically explaining to them like you know basically the impact of a uh, structural system, and um, because of the of the very very um, hard uh, deadline date and discussing uh, lead times and the actual time for um, like structural framing and then the time for uh, putting all the like you know metal deck and slabs on um, we found that like using a cast in place uh, structure we could save um, significant uh, um, uh, amount of time so for instance with a cast in place structure we could get um, basically started quicker because the lead time on rebar is massively uh, shorter than the lead time on rolled shapes and then uh, in terms of like our uh, rapid cycle uh, um, construction for this size of building and the way we could um, basically um, work our uh, uh, labor force, we could basically be pouring every two days and, and have our um, trades running out very efficiently in front of themselves. We were able to uh, complete the structure six months as opposed to using a, a structural steel uh, system. And that had uh, um, basically a, um, a great attraction to, to the client. Um, the other um, aspects about this uh, system, it, it very much um, it fit the aesthetics that the that the, the, the uh, landlord and the tenant were looking for. It kind of fit the, it gave an end result uh, of an industrial space that they very much liked. Um, so just discussing about what the typical floor like looked like. So it's kind of like you know um, what was old is new again. So this is a beautiful orthogonal column layout, like nice beautiful grids, um, and thus we had a nice, uh, very efficient uh, two-way flat slab. So we ended up with uh, um, a, like you know basically a uh, nice uh, eight-inch reinforced concrete flat slab uh, with uh, 14 by 14 uh, with 16-inch uh, thick drop panels. Um, we had uh, 30 by 30 columns. Um, where we had some long spans with 43 feet in the um, in the center there, we were using a, a wide, shallow like uh, um, beam, and then we had uh, a, a 16 inch core. So everything was uh, um, you know very efficient, and we had uh, you know quite a modest concrete strength of 5500, and we had about six pounds per square foot re um, uh, rebar for this two-way flat slab, which was again very efficient. So um, again, the efficiency came out of the design, uh, uh, basically the geometry of the uh, um, of the shape. So basically, us informing and then the engineer informing the architect kind of all working together collaboratively we zeroed on this uh, the structural system and then looking at the uh, lower levels because again this project has two levels of underground parking and um, because of the schedule and looking at um, uh, looking at the benefit of doing a top down as well as so we were basically going down doing the uh, uh, um, underground construction while we we're simultaneously going up the level one slab um, had to be designed with that thought process, that construction process already baked in. So um, even though, like, if you were looking at the service loads only, uh, a more optimized uh, um, uh, slab could have been done, but because of the shoring requirements, we ended up uh, selecting a 15-inch uh, flat slab 
um, uh, which was a bit thicker, but it was basically um, optimized and tuned to the uh, construction uh, shoring loads. And then also, um, again, um, in working closely and in real time with the engineer, um, they basically designed in the uh, access hole. So we had four 20 foot by uh, 30 foot access holes in the four quadrants. And uh, um, also, again, informing the engineer about the process of uh, uh, top down construction, um, they basically uh, uh, worked out that the, the, the slab would have minimal framing. Because obviously, with uh, uh, top down construction, you're basically um, uh, excavating, um, preparing a subgrade, pouring a mud slab. That mud slab is your formwork. And then you then you actually then put in um, your your rebar and then uh, cast that slab and then when you're actually um, doing the top down you're actually then going to excavate below and remove that mud slab and leave the soffit um, that that form soffit as the exposed ceiling so having a simplified um, uh, framing system is 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 critical and then the uh, lower level one so this is the uh, the first level of parking um, again this level is also going to be excavated underneath similarly had a, a simplified uh, system so again a 10 inch RC flat slab, um, easy to form uh, column capitals, and again, um, designed in uh, 20 by uh, 30 foot uh, temporary openings at the four sides. And then some details, again, these were designed in um, and they were um, basically uh, reviewed, reviewed by us, the GC, reviewed by us, the concrete, and then also reviewed by our foundation contractor on the different details. So basically in the top left, you're looking at a typical uh, connection detail for an interior uh, uh, caisson, uh, column slash caisson. So how you're actually going to connect that um, lower level slab to the uh, um, to this column. And so basically um, <clears throat> uh, having a keyway and then drilling in a series of dowels. And then at the perimeter we had secants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, we had already um, designed and simple, uh, uh, easy to construct detail where we had like, you know, basically a, a saw cut uh, keyway for where the slab is going to tool in. And then a simple uh, drill and epoxy set uh, bar. Uh, to allow that connection. So again, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but like, you know, again, the, these construction details were part of the initial concept of the design. And then just going on about foundations, um, there was a, a lot of stuff going on here. So we had, uh, um, because like I said, we had secants, and secants are a series of um, uh, like 34 inch diameter shafts, and they're basically put in in a primary that's unreinforced, and then a secondary that, which isn't reinforced, there's a lot of them to make around that, that loop around the city block. So there was uh, uh, 458 uh, piles and 100 uh, caissons, and all of it had to be done in a real hurry because obviously, like you know, we are, the, the clock was ticking, and we wanted to get our concrete teams on there right away. So they were uh, um, basically had their their schedule compressed to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, basically uh, 90 days, and they did it during the winter time. And in Chicago, winter time can be really tough. It's not only cold, but we can you know get these. Uh, um, like thaw days and can turn the whole site into uh, soup, which it did. Uh, but uh, hats off to Michaels, they, they muscled through it. And uh, um, they, they uh, basically also, <laughs> sorry, uh, the, the, the secants um, were going to be exposed eventually as the interior face of the, of the, uh, um, the parking garage. Now, obviously, uh, we had to inform and educate the, the uh, landlord and the tenant that, like, hey, this is, you know, going to have a, uh, an impact on the aesthetic, and it's going to also have some um, impact on the actual functionality space. Uh, again, we took them to some uh, um, other sites in the in the uh, in the city and showed them like what typical construction was, and uh, they they were absolutely okay with it. So again, we were doing our job and doing our duty as builders to basically kind of set the expectations of like you know what what is it actually going to look like. Um, uh, with regards to the uh, um, you know the the the, uh, uh, the interior core, we used traditional uh, sheet piling to create a coffer, and that was uh, built from like you know excavate and uh, uh, built from the bottom up. And I'll show you some slides of that. So just a quick uh, slide showing the uh, um, the foundation system. We had, uh, uh, like I said, 458 uh, secant piles around the perimeter. We had 100 caissons. And then we had the uh, um, the coffer around the, the core. And then, uh, um, again, the the um, foundations were very much like basically kind of a collaborative, almost delegated design. So the engineer record um, basically was informing um, the, the, the foundation contractor what the load demands were. And the, um, the, the contractor was, with their engineer, was basically fine-tuning the secant design as well as the, uh, the caisson design to make sure that they you know, not like, hit the, uh, obviously, engineering targets, but also like, you know, working with the aesthetics. The parking garages, they like you know they they work to actually try to help minimize the diameter of the of the of the uh, columns at the interior because of uh, like you know having them too large would have negatively impact uh, parking. So here's a detail, and again, like just kind of kind of giving a clue of like you know the, the collaborative nature of this. So Michaels um, uh, were the foundation contractor. They pretty much uh, like designed this foundation element. They were provided uh, the the loads by the EOR, and they designed this. Uh, 
uh, drilled shaft uh, uh, a caisson, um, straight shaft straight to um, our dolomitic uh, rock, which is about like you know 90 feet or so below grade, and uh, um, across the job site, depending on uh, uh, load demand, they varied in diameter between two and a half and five foot uh, six in diameter. There was a uh, 180 uh, KSF level bearing pressure. We used uh, O cell to prove uh, prove out uh, the the geotechnical um, uh, um, uh, of soil of the of the rock as well as prove out the. Uh, the, the actual um, test uh, caisson, and that was actually a production caisson, so we actually able to use it. Um, they were drilled under slurry, and uh, um, we were using a, a, a 6,000 psi uh, concrete that was um, uh, basically delivered by a tremi. And uh, uh, Keyway was installed um, during the installation process in anticipation of lower level one. So again, that's that again that close collaboration between um, um, us, GC, um, engineer record, and the foundation contractor, because basically all of us working with not against and and basically each step thinking about the next steps following so it was again that close collaboration and then here's some uh, details about the secant so the secant again is the earth retention and it's doing a lot of jobs at a lot of different times for a lot of different people so it's initially uh, um, as we are doing the uh, um, excavation down below before each level is put in there's no diaphragm there it is has a um, it's retaining soil at a greater height than it will will do a, a, as it's uh, in final service also, it's acting as a foundation element. So um, in, in, basically, it allowed the engineer a record to basically use this as a vertical support for various parts around the perimeter. And also, um, it helped us in, um, to allow to, us to support tower cranes on the east and west side. So again, working closely, collaboratively uh, as a team, we we're able to get these uh, multi-use uh, um, um, applications out of this uh, um, earth retention uh, foundation system. So again, this was. Um, all because we all got out of our silos and actually were uh, collaboratively uh, talking and working with as opposed to against each other. And then talking about the top-down uh, construction. So uh, we had, uh, um, uh, like, you know, the traditional approach is, like, you know, bottom-up, where you construct your uh, uh, deep foundations, you put in your earth retention, you have a big, massive excavation, and you then start your concrete from the, um, the bottom-up. And that is, uh, um, you know, definitely uh, more economical, but there's a big um, schedule impact to that. Um, Alternately, the top down, you basically construct the ERS and the, uh, um, the foundation elements simultaneously, um, and then it's, uh, you, you put a cough around the core, and then you're uh, basically uh, as rapidly as possible, as soon as the uh, foundation contractor is clearing a site, the concrete team's out there putting in level one and basically allowing, like, you know, have multiple trades working on the same job site, it's, and we really were focused on uh, compressing that schedule. So again, um, like, you know, working uh, with as opposed to uh, against each other. And so basically, uh, uh, like, you know, here's some photos, but just kind of the point, like, why do we do this? This definitely was uh, um, not the cheapest way to do it, but it's, it, it had a significant impact on the project ske schedule. So this, this choice here um, saved another four months. So like I said to you before, the cast in place option um, saved six months. This this uh, um, um, methodology saved us four months. So there's like you know it's a big deal for this project and for the um, the the the, the uh, uh, client like you know bringing your project to completion uh, has a you know a financial uh, uh, benefit because obviously you're, you know um, <clears throat> less uh, uh, financing costs on the debt and also uh, you're bringing your project uh, you know to the market faster. So why do it? Um, construction sequence bluntly like we were able to s um, save some significant time. Um, you know, the foundation ERS systems, like I said, uh, are, are, are basically um, being used as perimeter found, uh, uh, ERS as well as a foundation wall and used as uh, uh, gravity support and we're able to uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> use it for tower crane support uh, and, and uh, we were using a coffer, like I said, for the uh, around the core. Um, and like I said to you before, uh, the aesthetics, we, we informed the, the client about uh, um, the aesthetics of this approach because not only do you have the secant around the perimeter, but because we're using mud slabs as formwork and we're then, the excavator is scraping that off, there are um, some like, you know, scrape marks um, left which we will touch up, but to be honest, there is still going to be some, some marks, but because it was, uh, uh, again, explained and um, displayed uh, and, and everyone was educated, expectations were set and there was no surprises. Um, <clears throat> uh, Top-down construction, so just more um, details, so like, you know, complex sequencing, um, like, you know, just basically making sure, like, uh, we had good coordination between the excavation uh, team and the concrete team. Uh, there was issues with uh, access, because all the access was by those four holes. There was issues with uh, um, safety in terms of, uh, um, like, air. I won't go into that too much, but there was, you know, there was a lot of effort there. And then with the, in terms of the engineer, they had to, like, you know, work out with uh, 
um, like uh, ensuring that they were communicating properly with the foundation designer to make sure they could resolve the uh, um, base shear and uh, because that was um, how the, 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 you, the, they were basically using the first floor diaphragm to take out the, the base shear of the building and using the secant to deliver that. So again, close collaboration with those teams. Communication again, um, and also management of seepage, uh, doing the, and ba basically creating um, like basically special sealant joints between the, between um, the, the secants as required, and having a integrated drainage detail that the engineer um, uh, was uh, was uh, uh, very important. And let's just talk about logistics quickly. Um, so here's a, a site plan. We had two cranes covering the job. We had one uh, skip hoist. Um, at the north end, and we had those uh, four access holes. And then we had uh, um, uh, basically uh, streets on four sides, but primarily it was the, uh, um, the, the east and west streets where most of the deliveries were um, um, being made, as well as uh, um, like, you know, excavation of material. So it was a pretty busy site. Here's a, just a picture of our two tower cranes, um, happily parked on top of the secant. So again, um, you know, taking advantage of what's there, and it, it, we were able to do so because, again, a close collaboration. Um, here's another detail of the of the tower crane. Um, basically, a large mat um, balanced on the secant, utilizing one of the interior uh, uh, columns. And again, this was up first. This was up before we started any other concrete work. So again, literally, the uh, foundation contractor had come through, put these secants in, put in the uh, um, the case on there for the uh, first interior uh, uh, that column, and then we. The concrete team basically poured a portion of the uh, level one slab and put this up because if you don't have a hook, you don't have a job. So our that was a part of a you know critical path. Um, <clears throat> foundation ERS, like you know, like I said, uh, straight shaft top of rock, uh, perimeter secant, and uh, sheet pile around the core. And so you could see all those elements here on this very busy uh, site. While the um, at this point, I think we we're like um, the, the the foundation and the ERS uh, teams were. In full production and almost wrapping up, you can see the coffer there in the middle that's um, installed and hogged out, and you can see probably the beginnings of a tower crane um, being uh, poured over there. So there's a whole lot of activity. Uh, on a, even though it's a large site, it was a very busy site. And just so some details of the secants we, we formed and um, these guide walls, and then they had these like uh, pull out uh, foams, uh, uh, form voids to basically make sure that there was no uh, dimensional issues, and then just showing the operation. And then some pictures of the uh, you know traditional uh, coffer. So we basically put the coffer around the core, um, uh, like you know they excavated and as they were excavating, put the whales and the struts, got to the bottom, poured a mat across, and then we started building from the bottom up. And then just some photos of the uh, excavation. So we it was a very busy operation. We had up to uh, 1,600 cubic yards being pulled out every day. That's about 160 dump trucks. So this and this is a uh, like you know busy city city uh, street. So a lot of uh, coordination with. Uh, um, the, the neighbors and making sure we had uh, like you know uh, <clears throat> we were only going as fast as they could pull out and they could only go pull out as fast as they could dump into a truck so a lot of coordination there um, and then obviously uh, you know, challenges with safety and making sure uh, we had a, a, you know a, a safe uh, work environment and then maintaining schedule even with breakdowns so again this is a picture just showing like how the sequence went so this is a, a markup of showing the level one slab and then the uh, excavation that went underneath it. So um, start, like I said to you before, we started with the tower cranes first. We pour 1A and 1B are the two tower crane um, slab, portions of the slab and the, and the pads, and then we pour to the top, number two, and then all the way to, on, to the west, three and four. Once we went across there, the big number one and a Sharpie, that's where the excavator started right away. So like the excavator started doing his um, uh, like you know top-down excavation, while we, the concrete team, flipped to the south. So it was, uh, again, a, uh, um, uh, basically a focus on uh, speed. And then this is the same thing about on the lower level. So again, um, we were pouring in, in sections, and, the, and our, our excavator was following right behind us, and some nice photos of all this excavation. And then, obviously, there was even more details, because, of course, we're going up. So we had to basically, again, working with our engineer, uh, basically have a leave out in level two. We had some special uh, shoring there to allow us to, like, you know, um, basically shore above that, and then obviously like water management. So again, just trying to like you know um, allow us to go up and down simultaneously. Some more construction facts. So um, just concrete by the by the numbers, like 38,000 yards, uh, uh, 3,100 tons of rebar, 1.1 million square feet, 120,000 man hours work. So we were we were going, 
and communication was absolutely critical. Um, obviously, um, having an open line of communication, so RFIs were not languishing. We were, um, uh, and we had very rapid uh, uh, shop drawing um, uh, turnaround, so absolutely critical. And the other nice thing about this particular project, we had very minimal um, uh, MEPs, so the usual headaches of residential concrete work was, was less. And then uh, um, <clears throat> uh, basically the elevated decks, uh, we were um, basically on a two-day cycle. We broke it up into uh, six segments, and because it was such a large deck, we had our um, our decking teams out in front of us all the time. So we never had to like hop labor back and forth or try to like you know find things for people to do on like uh, everyone was at full capacity, um, full utilization all the time because we just kept on working out in front of us. So it was really allowed uh, rapid rapid uh, production. And then so we were like you know um, a whole lot of rebar, a whole lot of concrete, and a whole lot of finishing done per week. So these are big numbers per week, which is quite remarkable. And then uh, um, optimized shoring. So again, just because uh, we had trades coming up behind us, uh, worked out that uh, we could basically do a one plus two. You could see like you know uh, the exterior cladding coming up right behind us. And then a top-down sequence, just some more photos, like just some uh, again like what the conditions look like. And then basically uh, when we were down there, like you know once you were in, uh, basically. The stuff was deposited from the access hole. Um, there was uh, slick lines, and then like move, manually moving uh, a rebar from there. So like because of just that was a bit of a challenge. And then uh, um, limited access. Uh, um, you know, um, basically materials were basically stockpiled at the access hole, and then moved manually to the to the work area. Um, pumping concrete with slick lines, like I said. And then uh, connecting to the core, which is interesting because we, like I said, we did the coffers around the core, and we did traditional bottom up. Now we're going um, top down. So obviously you, the slab needs to make a connection to, to the to the core. So as we were excavating down and reached below, um, like you know, lower level one, uh, we had to actually work get our earth retention contractor back and scheduled to be there to actually remove enough of the uh, um, uh, the, the earth retention to actually allow us to deck over and to make that connection to the core. So again, close collaboration because you know our schedule was so tight, we just couldn't. You know, we needed their commitment to basically get their manpower on um, there to do this. And here's a like I showed you before those details. This is the actual executed detail, and you can see there's some you know. Um, the, the key wave in that core, uh, or sorry, in that column, apologies, was uh, like, you know, basically pre-located by Michaels from above when they're doing it. And then, like, you know, as we excavated down and cut the corrugated liner, we, lo and behold, they got it right. And then we drilled in and uh, put our uh, dowels. And then the, the secant there, you can see the, you know, we, we cut manually in a, a, a key way and we drilled in our number six dowel. So a really nice, uh, simple, elegant uh, solution. So in conclusions, um, contractor and designer collaborated to um, select the best structural system and work together to create details that helped us with our schedule, helped us with our, our, our budget. We, you know, we all worked collectively um, together, um, working with, not against. Um, the cast-in-place uh, structure allowed work to uh, start two months sooner and cut six months off the schedule. And the top-down basement construction saved about four months off our schedule. And then fundamentally, because this is what really matters, the architectural intent was not um, uh, sacrificed um, during this deep uh, design uh, contractor collaboration, um, but was preserved and were able to uh, um, complete the project and get a uh, happy client at the end.